Welcome to the fifth session of the Tennessee Farmers Market Vendor Boot Camp for 2023. Today is Tuesday, January 31st, and our session today is on consumer preferences at market. Dr. Alicia Ree from the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics at the University of Tennessee will be our speaker, and we are excited to hear more about consumer preferences. My name is Rachel Painter, and I'm a value-added agriculture marketing specialist with the Center for Profitable Agriculture with UT Extension. This session does help you qualify for a Tennessee Agricultural Enhancement Program credit. To receive a special requirement credit for the TAEP program, you will need to view five of the six one-hour sessions and complete the evaluation survey for each of those sessions attended by April 1st. This help you, helps you qualify for the application B sectors, and this is only one of those special requirements credits, so you will need two of those. So again, you will need to take this Farmers Market Vendor Boot Camp and watch five of the six sessions and complete the evaluation survey, and that will help you get one of the two special requirement educational credits that you would need to qualify for the TAEP cost share program. If you have questions about TAEP, you can reach out to the Tennessee Department of Agriculture at producer.diversification at tn.gov. Again, I work for the Center for Profitable Agriculture, which is a unit within UT Extension, and specialists at the center, like myself, assist farmers in evaluation, planning, and development of value-added enterprises. You can learn more about what that means in our programs at cpa.tennessee.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook at Value Added Ag. Of course, we work with our UT TSU extension agents across the state, and there is a county office in all 95 counties in the state of Tennessee. You can find your local extension agent and ask them questions relating to agriculture. You can also find your family consumer sciences agent and 4-H development agent in your local office as well. You can find your local office at utextension.tennessee.edu. We also work closely with the Tennessee Department of Agriculture. You can find more about their regulations and programs at tn.gov or their picktennesseeproducts.org website to learn more about the Pick Tennessee Products platform. It is a free marketing platform that is available to our farmers across the state that are selling direct to consumer, also to all of our farmers markets. So again, uh, please reach out to the Tennessee Department of Agriculture to get listed on that site. You can hit apply now at picktnproducts.org. Of course, we also work closely with the Tennessee Association of Farmers Markets, and you can find their website and their resources available, available at tnfarmersmarkets.org. There's a snapshot of their homepage, and our last speaker was their president, Casey, um, sharing more about how to just have a, a good time at the farmers market and be the best that you can be. And um, again, reach out to them if you have any questions from a vendor or manager standpoint. Again, today we have Dr. Alicia Reed from the UT Extension um, Specialist role within the Agricultural and Resource Economics Department at UT, and she is going to be covering consumer preferences at market. So I will turn it over to Alicia. As Rachel said, my name is Alicia Reen. I am over in the Ag Econ Department at the University of Tennessee, and my specialty is consumer behavior and preferences, especially for specialty crops and value-added markets. And so today, Rachel asked me to kind of talk about farmers markets, some of the literature that's out there related to consumer preferences for items at those markets, as well as kind of going to a little bit of marketing and such. So. Here's the agenda of what I'm planning on hitting today. We're going to start with a market overview because it's very important to know where things are sitting. There are some trends going on in the industry that you can then use when you're making business decisions moving forward. And then we'll go into some of the marketing, consumer behavior, and pricing, and then end with a slide related to trends that you might find helpful as you're thinking about business decisions moving forward. So let's start with that market overview. Some of you, I'm guessing there's a fair number of experienced growers and farmers markets participants on the call, but some of you may have seen this slide before. This is showing the number of U.S. farmers markets from 1994 through 2019. So this was the most recent data collection we, event we had. Um, and what you can see here is those green bars are the number of farmers markets, while the brown line shows the percent change from the previous years. 
And what you can see is there was kind of this steady upward growth through the 1990s and early 2000s. When the recession hit, it really took off, right? There was this big local movement where people, they were hurting and they wanted to help their local economy and keep the money in their local economy. And so they really started seeking those local food items from farmers markets at that time. So the number of farmers markets that were available to them increased because there was a need and there was unmet demand at that point in time. Now, what you're seeing, though, from about 2014 on is it's starting to plateau, meaning that we are meeting the demands that are out there and farmers markets, the accessibility of those markets for the consumer has uh, kind of hit that optimal point. That doesn't mean it's going to stop growing. It means that it's just that rate of growth is a little bit slower than it has been in the past. Um, and then this is from the AMS, and essentially it's showing kind of some of the benefits and changes that they're seeing at farmers markets. And so these are from farmers markets managers. And so these are things that as the grower, you may not necessarily have control over, but it's still good information to know. So about 33% of farm vendors increased their number of workers on the farm. And then 67%, if you look where the tractor is, of vendors increase their overall production. And what that says to me is that they recognize that there's still demand out there for these products and they, they needed to ramp up their production in order to meet that increased demand. About 40% where the carrots are in the middle there shows that farm vendors were able to sell imperfect products that would otherwise go unsold. If you think about how people buy produce, well, they'll go through, they'll look at the overall product to make sure just general quality or that it's whatever they want. Say they want tomatoes, right? They look at it and say, okay, I want tomatoes. This is about the size I want. Then every single time they pick it up, look at it on all sides, right? And depending on who the person is, what this is saying is that some of them were, were still okay with taking that product that wasn't exactly the perfect tomato. They were willing to accept some imperfections. Um, and what you see generally in your mass grocery stores is there's not a lot of acceptance for imperfect products, whereas at farmer's markets, there is some. And then this 77%, the lower right-hand corner, shows that farm vendors diversified the types of agricultural products they grew. Again, there's kind of this... Um, one of the drivers for farmers markets is that people like diversity of products and they like having access to items that they may not have access to more traditional grocery channels. And so it's good that the farmers are diversifying and providing people more options as they're making their food choices. So in terms of the number of products sold, and this probably is not a surprise to anyone on the call today, it's from 2019, it showed the percent of farmers markets, and this is across the United States, that sell these different product types. So fruits and vegetables, those fresh produce items, nearly 100% of farmers markets sell those. 94% sell condiments or sauces. 91% baked goods, about 87% are selling plants. And that's been an area that's been expanding in recent years. More farmers markets are offering those items. 85% are selling meat, seafood, or eggs. And this number has been increasing even more so than plants in recent years. You're seeing a lot more meats being available. And then eggs, as we all know, those are a prime uh, product right now. I suspect this upcoming year we'll see a fair number of those as well, provided the producers have the eggs to sell. 83% um, said miscellaneous items. 78% said other foods. So that would include your... Um, Maybe you have desserts or candies, anything along those lines. Uh, beverages were 60% and 44% said dairy. <clears throat> in terms of breaking these apart a little bit, in the fruits and vegetables, the vast majority were fresh, right? And that's not fresh, primarily vegetables. And then a few, little less on the fruit side, which when you think about that, most fruits are perennial crops. So they take a little more time, they take a little more space and a little more commitment than if you're growing fresh vegetables that tend to be more annuals. And then about 80% said herbs. In terms of plants, we're seeing a big bump in cut flowers. Last week, we did a couple workshops on cut flower growing here in Tennessee. 
And we had a lot of interest amongst uh, either beginning growers or people interested in expanding their product offerings to include cut flowers. And we're seeing that here in the farmer's markets as well. Um, container plants were also up in the uh, mid 80s. Uh, bedding plants were a little bit less in nursery stock. Again, those crops that require more perennial growth in order to be marketable in size, people were less likely to carry those in the farmer's market setting. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about marketing. And essentially, my goal here is to give you some information and some food for thought on ways to engage your customers through these different uh, marketing mixes. So if you're like me, you have not had a marketing course in many, many years. And so this is just marketing 101, the four piece of marketing. And these are all things that as the manager, the decision maker in your firm, you have control over these, right? And I just want to highlight the key point over here. They're all interrelated and they're all based on whatever your goals are, whatever your mission is, who is your customer, how are you reaching them, when are you going to market, and how many different items or SKUs are you selling, things along those lines. And you have to be aware of your customer base, their behavior, and be proactive in your planning in order to reach that customer base and be aware of what the competition looks like. Anyway, so the four Ps are product. So that's what you're selling. It can be its appearance, its features, the company name, brand, or story, as well as all the points of differentiation on why they should buy your product rather than something else that is in the market. Price, that one's pretty easy for people to understand, right? It's how much you're charging for it. But the factors that you have to think about as you're determining your price are what's the value to the buyer? What are your competitors' prices? Is your customer base price sensitive and to what degree? And then sales and discounts, which we don't typically see those in the farmer's market uh, channels. And there's a reason. We have a superior product. It should be at full price, right? And then promotions, that's any communications with your end consumer. So that can be messages, marketing, advertisements, um, timing, and location. And then price is how are you selling that product? Where are you selling it? Or play, place is where are you selling that to your customer? And in this case, we're talking about farmer's markets, right? So in this presentation, we're primarily going to focus on the product price promotion, but with more of a focus on that consumer and how he or she will react to these items. All right. So let's talk about the customer. So why do people shop at farmer's markets? And one of the nice things here is that it's really been well studied that people really enjoy shopping at farmer's markets. And ultimately knowing who buys and why helps you in determining your most effective strategies for communicating and with that customer, for communicating with them, for uh, attracting them, as well as engaging them. And then knowing the characteristics of your typical buyers allows you to identify your unmet demand, coordinate among the markets to decide on your best strategies on how to sell more product, and then develop more, stronger and more strategic plans moving forward. So why do customers shop at farmer's markets? There's a lot of research out on this. And fortunately, everything, regardless, a lot of these studies tend to be localized. So say just Tennessee, just Georgia, just Kentucky, wherever. But what we're seeing is a lot of uh, consensus across those studies. And what that means is that there's homogenous needs within the market, which makes it easier for you as the vendor to reach the customer because you know some of the drivers that are uh, driving their behavior. So the number one thing across the board is quality and freshness. People perceive farmer's market's produce as higher quality. And this is consistent and it is an expected standard that they expect to see when buying from direct from the farmer taste of the product, they really view it as being stronger, which if you think about it, you're picking tomatoes as they are ripening on the vine rather than something that's not quite ripe that then ripens on the shelf, right? So of course the taste is better than something that you can get through a traditional outlet. And one way to reach people, reach out to people through this is through offering, say, 
we have a picture of cherry tomatoes here having um samples available and what's funny is if you do that and watch people they'll grab that sample take about two to three steps it takes that long for it to register in their mind what they tasted and then they turn around and come back so it's kind of this great way to grab people and bring them into your store without you know without having to go through a lot of extra marketing uh, practices. Uh, third bullet here is they're looking for something unique or exotic. So a lot of people, they know what they can get at the grocery store. They can be pleasantly surprised at the farmer's market. So let me give you an example. I'm from Minnesota and we have a very large Hmong population. As such, we had a Hmong farmer's market. So you could go to this farmer's market and get produce that they were growing like along the medians of the highway, they were growing this produce. And it was unique to their culture because it was something that they brought with them and they knew how to grow. And because it was odd, they were also providing recipe cards explaining what it was, how it was different, how it was used in traditional um, cuisines, as well as recipes on how to clean it and use it, which was kind of a unique uh, thing that they were doing. Um, fourth point here, <clears throat> is there's this social atmosphere, this entertainment, it's something to do, right? And it doesn't matter if you're young, old, have young kids, have a dog, you, everyone can go and enjoy it and get some healthy products while you're there. People also like that direct contact with farmers. They like knowing where their food is grown, how it's grown, and that it supports you, the local farmer. So there's also that local element they like too, and keeping, again, back to some of the drivers during the recession, they like keeping money in the local uh, economy. And then <clears throat> they also like preserving rural livelihoods and farmland. This is a new one that has recently come to light because people are realizing with urbanization that a lot of farmland is being converted into suburbs and that that is impacting not only their own local areas, because all of a sudden they're driving through suburbs instead of farmland, but other people's livelihoods and potentially long-term sustainability as well. So that's a great one to talk about with your customer groups. And then there's <clears throat> this pro-environmental attitude. So there's decreased carbon footprint, lower uh, miles for the food to reach them, as well as anything related to sustainability. One of the things is that this... Um, attitude is prevalent amongst millennial consumers and millennials millennials are the largest generation that's out there and they also have the largest spending power they have 2.5 trillion dollars in spending power and so using some of these benefits is a great way to target that particular group of customers all right so it was a study here just two years ago, looking at people who buy produce at the farmer's markets. And what they found was that they are they have different consumption patterns. So these individuals have almost a 7% increase in fruit and vegetable consumption, a 9.4% increase in home meal preparation time, fewer meals away from home. And bear in mind, this was in 2021. So it may have occurred slightly before the pandemic. I suspect these numbers are higher because of the pan, would be higher because of the pandemic. And then they have increased access to and consumption of healthy foods. So if you think about this, you really want to think along the lines of, okay, these individuals are cooking from home. How can we help them? How can we engage them more? One way is recipes and, and ideas, especially if it's a product they may be less familiar with. You know, most people are familiar with tomatoes, right? We know how to use them. However, if you have a unique way to use them other than, you know, your typical salad, soups, et cetera, that might be of interest to people who do more work, more meals from home. Um, how to prepare, pro prepare produce. Again, if people aren't necessarily familiar with how to clean or how to uh, prep that product, it might be a good thing to share with them as well as the samples so they can try it and consider different ways of using that product when cooking at home. All right, so who are the people that are typically buying at the farmer's market? What we have seen is that they tend to be more educated. There's a higher percentage of women buying at farmer's markets, as well as they tend to be the grocery shopper of that household. 
And typically, in, historically in the data, what you see is women are the primary grocery shopper. That's shifting a little bit in recent years. However, it's still what you do tend to see. Um, number four here I thought was kind of interesting in that people are shopping in groups of two to three people. And what that means is you need to space out enough that you can accommodate two to three people and then multiple groups of two to three people. And then they're spending about 20% of their weekly grocery food budget at farmer's markets. And this equates to $28.50. But that spending is directly related to their household income. So with these in mind, here's another, some more food for thought. One of the things is that you need to think about accommodating these groups. It may mean getting a longer table and spacing your produce accordingly. Um, so in spacing your stalls out so that people can walk around all of the produce. And one of the things I've seen lately is that people are putting their cash register to the side with space around it to kind of stage things but then giving people the opportunity to kind of browse their products rather than having to congregate in one specific area, all right? And then just so you're aware, this is the 2020 Tennessee household income for every county in Tennessee. The darker the green, the higher the household income. And in my pricing slides, I'll throw this up again. And essentially something to consider is depending on where you're located and your proximity to some of these higher income counties, you may want to consider which of the markets you're hitting in order to get a premium for your products. Um, and of course, it also has several other, other factors that plays in such as uh, your timing, when are you available to go to market and when are these markets actually occurring? You know, there's lots of different factors that are, firm individual specific that you need to consider as well. But I just wanted to show you, of course, they're around the big metro centers, right? So Knoxville, uh, Nashville, and over by uh, Memphis and Jackson, you see some of those counties uh, highlighted in green. Okay, so there are some other drivers or factors driving visits and purchases. I thought it was interesting that local will trump organic. It's great to be local and organic, but if you have to choose one, local is the one that people do resonate, does resonate better with people than organic. Social norms are also more important than environmental concerns. So this means that their family, friends, or peer groups are expecting them to buy more local products. Maybe they're meeting up at the farmer's markets and having a coffee while they buy their weekly groceries. So social norms are important as well. And then people who have negative attitudes towards industrialization also frequent farmer's markets. And then seasonality, spring and fall, people get tired of the winter. They wanna get out and buy some fresh product and um, enliven their diets. And then fall, it's seasonality, right? It's harvest time. They really enjoy that. So some thoughts here is using signage. QR codes are huge if you can link that back to your website um, and essentially emphasize this key information about how it is helping the farm, how it is helping your local community, maybe your brand, whatever your website is and then any seasonal produce. And again, you could add recipe information so that you're not printing out as much information, but it's still readily available to that customer. And I have seen in particular, some of the local uh, cut flower folks putting their QR code on a business card that then goes along with that produce. So people can have kind of a reminder and something else to check on in uh, their free time once they're away from that area where they purchased it. Um, there are a few other factors impacting visits. Ease of moving between vendors is important to consumers. So the general retailers, so think Target, think Walmart, they all are aware of this. There's this uh, concept of butt space where if you go and look down an aisle and there's not going to be enough room for you, your body, and your cart, you're going to skip that aisle, go to the next one, and loop back, right? People want space, otherwise they feel crowded, they don't feel comfortable barging through, right? So that's something to be aware of. And then 
people often travel to attend farmers markets. It's their event of the weekend, and this is amplified for Saturday markets. So if your schedule accommodates it, you may see larger crowds on the weekend when people aren't working, and they tend to be the people who do have weekday jobs where they tend to have that higher income. So it may be, if you're not currently attending a Saturday market, it may be worth your time to explore options that uh, include a Saturday market. In terms of some of the other factors, interpersonal trust often drives consumption behaviors. So this is where you have the farmer, the salesperson, whomever it is at your booth, and they're the ones interacting with that customer. So this is between the consumer and producers. All positive interactions are viewed as building this relationship, building this trust, and then sufficient communications between them. So maybe you have them sign up for a newsletter or something, and you don't bombard them, right? You don't spam them with 20 emails a day, but maybe it's a weekly newsletter letting them know what you're gonna have at the market that weekend. And then experience. So satisfaction with that previous farmer's markets has a positive impact, and it means they tend to return to that market, which is beneficial for everyone. So the food for thought on this one is think about how you're telling your story. Again, e-newsletters work really great. They're fairly easy for you to um, edit and send out. They're inexpensive, and people sign up for them, so that means they do want that information. Signage is a good one, especially with your brand on it so that people know who they are buying from. And then this may generate brand loyalty. And then people are visiting and then it's kind of along the lines of you're visiting with guests to your farm because you're like the satellite for your farm at the farmer's market. And so it's their weekend. They're enjoying themselves. This is an opportunity to kind of host them in a mini scale on your farm. Okay, so some of the barriers. The first one we've talked about is this congestion. You know, the, there's a picture on this slide of a congested market. And in my mind, I have two small kids. They're seven and four. I'd look at that and be like, uh, we're not going there because that just asked for me to lose my kid. I was looking at this picture and I saw one kid here. She's on her dad's shoulders. Otherwise, that's a lot of opportunity to misplace a child or a dog or get your toes stepped on and trying to get through people to get at the produce and look at it. That can be a challenge. And I understand many of you, this isn't something you would have control over. It's more the manager of the market, but it's something to be aware of, right? On one hand, you really want the customers because you're selling more product. But on the flip side, if it's too congested, it's a deterrent for people to visit that market in general. Um, difficulty or distance when carrying items. I always think of if you buy a watermelon, right? That if you buy it on the way into the market, that's a problem because then you have to carry it all the way through. Or if you buy it at the far end of the market, then you have to carry it all the way back. Some people are strategic and they will come back and grab it on the way out. But if you have other smaller items, there's a greater chance they would pick them up further into the market and come back and just get that watermelon rather than all of it. So I'm not sure exactly how to fix this difficulty or distance to carry items, but it's something for you to think about and think about your positioning and strategies to help minimize that for your customers. Inconvenience is always a barrier. Maybe the location just isn't somewhere that they think about or go to. Maybe the hours are only during their work hours, right? Or the product offerings aren't as great as what they would like. And then all of those result in them tending to go to more, uh, more uh, traditional grocery outlets. And then not accepting credit cards. This is one where if you were considering getting a chip reader, look at your budget and see if it's in there. If not, you know... Make, make wise choices based on your own situations. But credit cards, a lot of people, especially in urban areas, don't necessarily carry cash unless it's a known thing and they're farmers, markets, regulars, where they know cash is the currency that people prefer. All right, I do want to emphasize this. Price is rarely a factor impacting purchasing decisions. People going to farmers markets, it's not it's not really because they're expecting a deal. Rather, they're expecting that quality local product and they're willing to pay for it because they view it as a premium item. Okay, 
So I wanted to shift gears here a little bit and talk about marketing. Again, some of you, actually, I'm going to assume that the vast majority of you already have a brand that you're using. It can be your farm name. It can be the farmer. It doesn't matter. But the reason I want to emphasize brand is that this is something that can generate loyalty. And loyalty, it it overcomes a lot of potential issues that you have moving forward. So for instance, um, if we hit a recession, which they're talking about for 2023, loyalty to that brand means that they may come to you or they have an increased likelihood of coming to you rather than switching out for a less expensive item, okay? So that's just one example. But a brand is a name, term, design, symbol, or any other feature that distinguishes one seller's goods and services from others. And essentially, as you think about your brand, everything that you do at the market, everything that you're selling is representative of that brand and it is building that brand. And you really want it to just be that point of differentiation. And it doesn't matter exactly how you design the brand. It can be simple or complex, a logo or image, color or black and white. That's up to you and your own personal preferences. But it should include that company name and it should communicate the value proposition. So the value proposition is what makes you different and then what makes it more valuable than other um, options that are out there. It can be your story. It can be the service. It can be the recipe cards. Anything related to that would be your value proposition. And feel free to ask for feedback. What does your uh, brand communicate? Does it capture consumers' attention? Does it reflect the company values? Or even think about yourself, say you're looking at it without any, try and approach it with, uh, with a fresh viewpoint, like, okay, this is, let's assume this is the first time I've seen this brand. What's it say to me in order to try and get an unbiased view of that? Um, food for thought here, really think about what your value proposition is. What makes it your products and what makes your firm different from your competitors? And then one of the big things with farmers markets and local produce is this human brand element. So it, it provides a relatable identity. It can be a person, the farm, the family history, or a story. I have this Three Sisters Pies on the right, and it has a black and white photo of these three ladies. And it makes you think of, okay, if you buy this, it's the pie recipe that grandma developed when she was on the family farm with those fresh peaches from the backyard you know it kind of implies a lot through this brand through this human brand element um a broader one would be for example martha stewart i mean if any of you reach martha stewart level i'd be very interested in hearing your story but it gives you kind of that idea of the person who represents the brand and now she's in everything right not exactly relevant here, but it does give an example. But essentially, with regardless of the what human brand element component you choose, you really need to emphasize the benefits and differences and let it support that value proposition. Um, I wanted to just briefly touch on er on imperfect produce. Like I mentioned earlier, in the grocery store, they're essentially shrinkage, right? They don't get sold. However, in the farmer's market, there's a lot more uh, tolerance. And frankly, amongst tomatoes, they've now become a hot item even in the typical grocery store. But in the farmer's market setting, there's also greater tolerance if the produce is organic. People are willing to accept more imperfection, aesthetic differences. Or if it's color related, they may assume, okay, that tomato's got a little bit of green still on it, but it'll change. They're okay with that. Um, there is an opportunity for you to educate the customer about the cause, especially if it's purely aesthetic, because that doesn't impact the flavor or the quality or the potential health benefits of consuming that uh, product. There's an opportunity to do discounts depending on, again, your budget and what the product is. You don't want to... You don't want to undercut anyone at the market because really you just want to build each other up rather than build prices down. But I have seen people that, I, particularly apples during um, the fall, right? So apple pie season, where they have items that maybe 
maybe they have a little bit of spot damage or bruising and they advertise them as pie apples and have a discount on them rather than having them sorted with the fresh eating apples. So something to think about. What's interesting here is this last point though. So the appearance is more important for older consumers. So if you're at a market where you tend to see this older clientele, you may want to really consider alternative uses for those or an educational opportunity in order to move that product. Whereas if you're amongst younger clients, appearance is less important. They rather look at that flavor and quality. So here's the food for thought related to this is how can you strategically position your produce? Again, thinking about uh, educating people about why that product looks that way. Maybe it was a wet year. Maybe um, something happened during production that even though it tastes fine, it just looks a little different than what they would see in your typical grocery store. All right. So one last slide on branding. So the importance here in building that brand and feeding into that brand is that you're wanting to build brand equity, which gives you a little bit of leeway as things happen in the market. And part of this is that people then perceive the products from your stand as meeting a certain quality standard. And so every time they buy from you, they expect it to be that standard, if not better, right? And this also retains loyal consumers meaning they will come back to you to buy the products. And this is beneficial because you spend less money on promotions and less money on retention and engagement with those customers. They already know your story. They already know what they're buying and they're coming back to you. So let's talk a little bit about loyalty. What keeps customers loyal? We'll say exceptional products. We've already touched on that. You all have exceptional products. The brand, we've touched on that as well. And you all are working towards maintaining, building, and leveraging that brand, and then customer service, right? So we are engaging the customer, we're talking to them, we're setting ourselves apart from those mass retailers. Um, essentially, what's your story and why is your product better, right? Okay, so loyalty. Many businesses are interested in this. This is like the silver bullet because it, it really reduces the efforts you need to put forward. And it can impact your profitability and drives growth. The loyalty has been defined as the willingness of someone to make an investment or personal sacrifice in order to strengthen a relationship. So again, they're coming back to you, whether or not it's, it's the easier choice, right? So they get those repeat purchases and it can result in recommendations. If you think about it as an individual, as yourself, when you're looking for something, don't you ask people that you trust for their recommendation? Well, this often people who are valuing farmers markets and the produce they're in will recommend these things to their friends, especially if they have an amazing experience at one of the stalls. They'll say, you have to go buy your bread from so-and-so at the farmer's market. It's amazing. So again, repeat buying is the point of loyalty. It makes life easier for everyone. It's not because there are no other choices or because it's easiest. It's just because they have already engaged with you. They like the product. They are your the loyal customer. And the opposite of loyalty then is switching. So they switch to a different firm or a different product, um, often due to dissatisfaction. So satisfaction is, you know, this slide makes me laugh every time because it's like satisfaction is you go, you get a loaf of bread. Okay, it does the job. It makes my sandwich and it's a vector for all the good stuff in the sandwich to get to my mouth and me to consume it. But it's, it's a loaf of bread, right? Conversely, delight is this emotional response where people are like, oh my gosh, it's chewier, the flavor's better, or I had an awesome experience learning about how this was made. And they're more likely, if they're delighted, to remember it, to be engaged, and to make those repeat purchases of those products. So let's define these real quick. Customer satisfaction is a measure of success based on the, their expectations and performance of a product or service, right? So it's here, and it's good. It's just customer delight elevates it, right? That's an emotion developed as a result of a reaction to an event, such as purchasing of a product, which combines surprise and joy and it's a precursor of customer loyalty. And this can be created 
or it can create intense reactions from consumers. While the opposite is regret. They're the people that say, I never want it. I am sorry I bought this, right? Buyer's remorse, and this leads to switching. So just so you're aware, to complete this entire picture here, the switching comes from either competitors luring that consumer away or a poor retail experience or poor product experience, indifference by the consumer, better, a better choice becoming available, or boredom. Fortunately, at farmer's markets, you have a competitive advantage in that a lot of these are not necessarily factors, but it's good to have it in the back of your mind to take actions to prevent these from occurring and retain that loyal customer. Okay, switching gears to an online presence. And often people will ask, do I need to have an online presence? The short answer is yes. If you are looking for information, if you are curious about something, one of the first things anyone does is pulls up their phone and looks at it, right? If I'm interested in buying local apples, I may Google it on Google Maps. And if it's not there, I don't know it's there, right? I don't know where I can go to buy these products. So this is very important in a couple different ways. One, it builds awareness for your firm, for your brand, what products you're selling and growing, and where they can buy your products. Maybe you aren't set up to have on-farm visits. That's okay. Come see us at the farmer's market on Saturday. Here's the address of the farmer's market. And depending on how you're set up, these having an online presence doesn't necessarily mean you're updating it every day, every week, et cetera. You just need to have it so that if people are looking for you and for information about you, they can easily find your brand story and the story behind the business that you have. This is also a way to engage consumers. You could use it as a review platform where people can use e-word of mouth, which is free advertising, to talk about the wondrous products that you're offering. And it's often good to keep these simple. Keep it in bite-sized pieces for the customer. Don't, don't write an academic paper on your firm. That's probably not going to go over well, but give them just bite-sized pieces that they can easily digest and gather information about your products and your firm. So. The food for thought here is you need to be where your customers are in order to leverage your value proposition and people are online. So this is a study that I'm currently involved with and I just pulled the cut flower data from it and it's showing where people are seeking information for local cut flowers. And the top five here are Facebook, a search engine such as Google, uh, website ads, online product reviews, and internet articles. So the top five places they're going are all online platforms, right? And in the middle, we have recommendations, TikToks, Instagram, you know, it's still online platforms, but then towards the right, you have your more traditional outlets, outlets of magazines, TV, direct mail, radio, and newsletters. And if you think about your personal return on investment, the ones to the right tend to be more expensive than the online content to the left where people actually are. So kind of keep that in mind. These are further justification of having that online presence. Um, and this is, if ever you have a quiet moment, go online and go to Google Trends. You can type in uh, word searches and see how popular they are and look at the seasonality. So this was farmers markets in Tennessee for the past five years. And what you can see is that January, it starts slowly ticking up and then it peaks during the summer and gradually goes down. Here we have November, December, January, ticks up again. So you can see the seasonality of searches for farmers markets. And the key here though, is that if you have your information online, you want it to updated when it's in this lull, right? You want to update during the quiet period so that when people start looking, your information is updated and readily available to them. Now, if we take this same information and expand it out for the past, oh, quite a few years, since 2004, this is interesting because, okay, there wasn't as much access to the internet when you're in 2004, but it's there. You can still see some of the seasonality then the recession hit and look at the broad interest for farmers markets, again, just in Tennessee.
but then we see the seasonality consistent from there on out that people are looking for information rel related to farmers markets in Tennessee consistently throughout essentially very early spring through the fall. And then they take a break over the winter months. And you see similar trends across the country. It's a little more prevalent as you get into greater season variability. So I'm from Minnesota. We do not do farmers markets in the winter. And there's a reason for that. Nothing grows. All right. So let's talk about pricing. Um, lots of people ask, how much should I charge for these different items? And I would say that it comes back to keeping a budget of what it costs you to produce that item and then adding a markup to it so that you are making a profit because if you're not making a profit, you probably shouldn't be growing that product, right? Um, for budgets, these come with variable costs as well as fixed costs. On the right, I have a sunflower budget just for your example. The variable costs are those right here and essentially those are the ones that they increase for the number of items that you're uh, producing so if you want to grow sunflowers you're going to need more fertilizer more pesticides uh, more soil tests if you're expanding the field you're producing in plastic mulch etc right so that's variable costs vary depending on the amount grown then fixed costs those are the ones that stay the same regardless of the amount of plants you're growing. So fixed costs examples are down here, machinery and equipment, land, the irrigation system, and additional inputs, right? And so there are several examples out there. This, like I said, I just pulled a couple uh, cut flower ones. This is the Penn State sunflower one. They also have a Lysianthus and I have the website down here, but we also have ones from UT, from the University of Tennessee at, my department in ARAC that are available to you online. And those include sample budgets for tomato operations, bell peppers, blueberries, and blackberries. So I would encourage you to explore these if you haven't done so already. So you need to, when thinking about setting price as well, is assess that market. What are people in your area getting for similar products? Because you don't want to undercut them. Rising tide raises all ships. You want to lift each other up because these are premium products. Um, but you also don't want to go so high that the customer is not willing to pay for it, right? So many of you may be aware of this, but there are Tennessee farmers market price reports at the Center for Crop Diversification at the University of Kentucky. Those are right here. When you click into that, it has different products listed, the dates, and then the county and the prices with in that county, okay? Here I just have cut flowers because they're a new product category only from 2022 and we only had Knox and Rutherford counties. So for me to share this with you quickly, this was kind of, this was an easy one for me to do. Um, but they have a variety of different fruits and vegetables um, available to you to look at at that website as well. But here you can see just the example in May in Knox County, we start with $15 for a small jar of cut flowers, 20 for a small bouquet, 30 to 40 for a large bouquet. And then as we get further into June, we see all of a sudden, okay, $5 for a sunflower stem, $2 for a dahlia stem. And then into early July, all of a sudden we have uh, lavender coming in and some other products. So when thinking about pricing, really record keeping is vital in terms of identifying your costs and labor is a cost. So record keeping helps drive that budget so that you're aware of exactly what it's costing you to produce that product. Um, you also should be thinking about what's your end goal and what needs to occur in order to reach it. So if I want to make X dollars in profit, then I know approximately how many tomatoes I'm going to produce, how many, uh, I don't know, uh, cut flowers I'm going to produce. I need to be charging X amount or reaching towards charging X amount in order to make my profit goals. Um, and then you also need to assess the market. So what are other firms charging? And then what's the household income for your target market? So here's another example from that same data set um, that I was just sharing, looking at tomato prices for 2022 in Knox County versus Hamblin County. And you can see in Knox County, we're sitting at nearly $3.50 per pound of tomatoes. 
throughout the uh, growing weeks. And then in Hamblin, they're sitting at a little, right around 260 per pound of tomatoes. And this comes back likely to that household income um, because Knox is a very urban area. It has a little bit higher income than Hamlin County. So for example, the 2021 income of Knox versus Hamlin, Knox County is sitting at almost 66,000. Hamlin's a little bit over $48,000. So that does come into play in terms of grocery budgets and what people are willing to pay for produce at farmer's markets. If we continue with this example, here, show, here shows several years worth of data for the Knox County tomato prices. We have 2017, 18, 19, and 22. And what's interesting here is that, okay, in 17, as more product entered the market, you saw the, the pricing dip a little bit, but in 2022, one, we're starting at a slightly higher point, right? But it's also continuing to increase. And it'll be interesting as we go through the year to see if it does continue to increase or if it plateaus. There's not, not usually a ton of variability within the market, but it's always interesting to look at these trends and see where we're sitting. So this is Knox County. And then if you look at Hamblin, again, slightly lower price point, 2022, again, we're higher than we have been historically and fairly straight across the board, but it is lower than Knox, but still um, can give you some reference points if you're attending a farmer's market in that area to see uh, about where you should be pricing your product in addition to the costs of production that you are keeping in your budgets. So again, here is your 2020 Tennessee household income. You do send, tend to see higher incomes in those more urban counties than those that are a little bit further out. Um, and so it may behoove you to think about hitting a couple different markets depending on your schedule to hit some of those higher income counties if you are able to do so. Okay. Some other considerations, think about what your most profitable crop is and why it's most profitable. You may consider specialization, meaning that you grow one or two items instead of multiple, depending upon your situation and if it's something that is unique to you. I think of lavender farms, right? So they are primarily growing that product and then they bring the, that to the market when they're uh, ready to sell it. And then you need to weigh your labor versus profit and keep those that best uh, suit your situation. And it is okay to fire crops that just don't work for you. Maybe they're money sinks or maybe they're susceptible to disease or insects. So on the left here, this graphic shows across the top your cost versus effort, cost and, cost and effort. And on the left is your value or benefit. So if you put your crops in each of these boxes, you would probably want to fire those that cost you a lot to produce, but were cheap for the producer or the grow the consumer, right? Those are not the wise crops to keep. Conversely, those that don't cost you a lot to produce, but people pay a high value for are good ones to hold on to. And then these other two, it really depends on your own situation and goals on whether or not you keep those crops in your product offerings for consumers. Big thing here is keep those records so that you know your cost, demand, seasonality, markets, and consumer engagement, et cetera. Um, and then that'll allow you to identify those crops that are most profitable for you to produce. And also identify your target market, whether it's in your county or another county. Are you targeting retirees, millennials, young parents? You know, think about who tends to buy your products and whether you want to shift that a little bit, keep it on point, and how you can engage those folks. Okay. One last slide on some trends that you should be aware of, and some of you may be aware of these. Um, there is an opportunity to add value-added products, meaning you have your raw product, you take it a step further. For example, maybe you have cut flowers and now you dry them and offer dried uh, arrangements as one of your options. This is a good way to extend your season, and the, some of these are really good profit generators. However, you need to consider storage do you have extra product to create these value-added products? And then if you're making a food item, what are the regulations that are associated with that? Uh, secondly here, we are now in an experience culture. Years before, people tended to buy products to symbolize themselves and show their personality. Now people are spending more money on experiences 
rather than goods, meaning that they may want to experience cooking in a different way, which may give, be a good opportunity for those recipe cards. Or, you know, the farmer's market experience itself is going to be very popular amongst consumers. And then the third is having outstanding customer service and experience again. So customer satisfaction is good, but customer delight results in repeat purchases and loyalty. All right, and that is everything I have for you today. So um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Yes, so we do have a few in the Q&A. One is anything for honey pricing suggestions. Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I don't have anything right now, but I'm going to make a note and uh, see if I can find anything on that. And if I cannot, I will recommend it to the people who do the budget to add to their list and have them ask that they start collecting that as they're attending farmers markets. Because the other thing I should mention, if any of you would love to report your uh, pricing at your farmers markets, we're always looking for more reporters. So let me just throw in that shameless plug, but honey pricing, I've made a note and I will look into it. Thank you. Um, next from the guest, it just says basically um, that there used to be some larger wholesale farmers markets that they remember visiting. So any information or ideas about the differences in smaller and boutique farmers markets versus larger wholesale farmers markets? Oh man, that one, in my mind, I think it tends to be more regional, right? So mm -hmm. for example, um, we moved here from Orlando, Florida, and they had a very large wholesale farmer's market, but it was not a grower's market. It was people buying off the trucks that go to Publix and bringing those produce in. And so um, in that instance, though, people were, the customers that were there weren't necessarily realizing that they thought it was a local product. And so that's that's just an example of something where it was a little weird to me and definitely different because Minnesota was different. Um, I'm trying to think of the best way to answer that question because I do see this shift more towards that small boutique. And part of me thinks that it's building that image for the customer, you know, keeping it local, keeping it uh, the products going to that customer. It may be that farmers are those larger farmers are recognizing better markets that meet their business strategies as well and so maybe they're not necessarily attending those markets as much as they used to you know there's there's a lot of options i'm not 100 percent sure but i suspect there's several things that are uh going into that trend okay next question is is there a trend of consumers wanting produce that they don't have to cook so i know you covered a little bit at the beginning um some information about why consumers are choosing different products at the market or trends of cooking at home. So any information about what they are looking for or things that they do not have to cook versus something that they would have to cook? Mm, that's a good question. You know, so people like keeping it simple, right? So if it's something that you can readily eat, snack on with very little preparation, that's always good provided it's healthy. Um, and Ultimately, it depends on the personality of the individuals buying it, right? Some people really enjoy cooking. Others would rather have it prepared for them, right? And they don't have to put in that effort. Um, so I'm not 100% not sure if there's really a trend towards things they don't have to cook. I know there are those individuals that would rather have it pre-sliced and diced for them. All they have to do is throw it in a pot. Um, but at the same time, that requires more labor or labor, more packaging, more, a lot more effort that a lot of people, especially the smaller farmers, maybe aren't uh, set up to handle. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, next question. What are the top profitable vegetables? Um, <laughs> again, that's, that's a good question. Um, and obviously that's going to vary based on your location, your production costs, um, many different variables there. 
Um, you want to take a swing at that one? Oh man, I'm going to have to look that up. I'm not even going to hazard a guess at this point, <laughs> but I'll look it up. And Rachel, maybe you can send an uh, uh, email, follow up email to everyone. Yeah. So again, uh, profitability, you know, that's going to be determined by your cost of production and your market channel is going to, you know, very much de determine what you're going to see as far as sales and revenue. Um, but again, that's going to vary very widely across the state, across every operation. Um, I would encourage you to reach out to your local farm management specialist. They can help you develop budgets and compare different enterprises against one another. So if you're raising squash and you want to compare that to your tomatoes, they can help you um, complete those budgets that are available. And um, again, that is a free service through UT Extension. Again, the Center for Farm Management is how you would contact them or find them. And again, that's called the Manage Program. So again, find your local farm management specialist. Your local extension agent in your county office can help you get in touch with them as well. Next question, how do you keep the line moving? Are customers okay with me pre-weighing tomatoes so it does not take time at purchase time? Mm. You know, on one hand, I would say yes for like the cherry tomatoes, right? They're already in that little container so you know how much they weigh. The larger ones, if you can, it's gonna take more time on your part, but if you could sort them by size. So you have your medium size that all are all about the same size, the larger ones, et cetera. So you know, in your mind, you know, three of those equal a pound. That may be one way to uh, think about that. But again, for you, that would mean more labor on your side, right? And you may or may not have time for that. Um, that's what I think of with tomatoes. Well, you could similarly have it the prices based on okay if you buy one of the medium tomatoes it's 50 cents versus two is a dollar so you know it's math automatically but again when they get to the cash register then you have to deal with change a little bit more change and that may or may not be ideal okay next how can you help your county start or revamp a local market that are in counties that are more rural perhaps with an older population that is not as trendy to bring in more to elevate the local farmer's produce. We have one small market that could use some help and one that they call a flea market. Um, feel free to answer privately. Again, um, I would really encourage you to reach out to the Tennessee Association of Farmers Markets and see about um, some advertising campaigns and resources that they have available to help. Um, really, that is going to be determined on um, trying to find support from other local farmers that are interested in starting such a market um, or growing your market. And that simply takes time and effort. And um, again, we have some guides and, and booklets that can help you through that process, but it simply is just a lot of time and effort. And again, maybe a rural area, if it is not supporting a farmer's market, if it keeps failing or you know, getting smaller every year, maybe you do need to look at going to an area that can, you know, help you capture that more premium price instead of trying to support a market if the support from the community is not there. So there has to be demand as well as farmers that are willing to be involved. So again, um, not a great answer, but happy to discuss that with anyone across the state um, at any time. So feel free to reach out to me uh, by email or Alicia by email as well. Well, and you could consider partnering with uh, organizations or events that they're already attending. So I don't know, maybe they have a group get together once a week that you ask if they'd be interested in having it hosted at the farmer's market. So there'd be a greater, gener a greater group of people coming through. And since they are there already, they may be interested in buying some of the product just to kind of generate awareness or increased awareness of what's going on, where it is, uh, what they could potentially buy at that uh, place. Okay, next, can vendors agree on a tomato price per pound? Huh, <laughs> I'm not sure about that one. So again, prices are gonna be determined on um, where you are, where your market is and what your 
consumer is willing to pay for a tomato, um, a different type of tomato. Maybe one tomato is just your typical, you know, pink lady slicer, and something else is more of a niche, um, you know, orange or some some niche product tomato. So again, that's going to vary widely based on the tomato that you have to offer, and also your consumer and what they are willing to pay. Um, some markets do encourage vendors to discuss prices before the market opens and just make sure that no one is kind of cutting each other, um, you know, that again, Alicia mentioned that earlier, rising tides, you know, raise all ships. So let's not undercut each other. But also, you know, we have to consider different people's cost of production or operation. So again, um, you know, there's there's no rule or regulation that everyone has to agree on a tomato price before a market opens by any means. But it does um, help if vendors will talk about their prices and just make sure that you are also covering your cost of production. So again, um, it doesn't help anyone if you are undercutting your prices and selling below your cost of production and not really having a profit margin. So. Again, you can discuss and vendors can definitely agree if they would like to, um, but there's no rules that you have to. Mm. Next. Um, well, okay, so there are some, uh, a comment here from Megan LeFew, my coworker at the UT Center for Profitable Agriculture. There are some regulations on allowable units of sale of products from TDA, Consumer and Industry Services, weights and measures. Uh, different products can be sold by weight, dry measure, or by count. And uh, Megan will share that with me so we can send that out in the follow-up email. Thank you, Megan. Okay, next question. What is the relationship between loyalty and having a tough growing season? Anything you can do to keep consumers even during a tough season, or should you start over with gaining loyalty again? So something to remember with this is that people are very understanding as long as you're transparent and educate them saying, okay, this year when the tomato plants bloomed, we had very cold weather and it damaged those blooms or the honeybees weren't as active, you know, something along those lines and tell them, okay, so this is what we have, but at, this isn't our typical year because the weather didn't cooperate with us because they all know you cannot control the weather and that your products are primarily dependent upon the weather. I think more so from like the CSA standpoint, right? That if you're selling a community supported agricultural share and they get a small box one week, if you include that letter or newsletter with it saying exactly why they're getting that product, then people are much more understanding and they get it. And provided you handle it in a way that educates them and is transparent, we don't necessarily see a negative impact on loyalty. You may have to, like in a subsequent year, remind them you're there and that good things are happening, but it's more so that you just have to remind them. It's not that they write you off completely because you had flooding one year or something. You know, it it does, people do tend to be very forgiving, especially if they already have that loyalty, that ingrained engagement with your farm and maybe they're following you on social media and they know all about the troubles you're having that year. And that's okay. You know, we're all human and we, like I said, we don't have control of the weather and people do tend to be very understanding. Thank you.